go to their browser and they first log in, the first thing they're going to see is their dashboard. Uh, the dashboard is user specific, so users can configure the dashboard to see any type of information that's relevant to them. Uh, Query Surge is a web based application, which you'll see is it works very similar to desktop apps. You have drag and drop functionality. Uh, you'll also see right click menus when you click on any of the items that exist within Query Surge. Uh, these dashboards are configurable, uh, so you can have multiple panes. Uh, you can add and remove panes, delete them through our Add Widget console. So if I have additional panes I need to add them, I can drag and drop them uh, into uh, Query Surge to showcase those features. I'm just going to drill into one of our reports just to um, give you some insight into some of the metrics that Query Search can capture. Uh, what we're looking at here is our scenario outcome, the later data reliability report. And what this is showcasing is we're monitoring a specific set of tests called shipping. And this test is being repeatedly executed uh, on a regular basis. And what it's showing is we're getting pretty consistent results. Every time this runs, we're getting about 132,000 verifications that are passing. 33,000 verifications that are failing, which means our data is about 80% accurate. Now, that's a pretty low number. You'd probably want your data in the high 90s, but this is a demo environment, so we have some intentional defects in here to showcase some of Query Search's capabilities. But of course, the idea here is if that blue line dips down or that those red bars shoot up, that means you're getting more bad data in your system than uh, you've done on previous runs, and that might be something you want to investigate. And all these different widgets are configurable, so you can monitor, in this case, I'm monitoring this shipping scenario, but you have the ability to monitor um, other scenarios and kind of display these reports that are going to bring back relative information to what you need to see on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition over to our design library. Uh, this is where we construct the different query pairs or tests that Query Surge is going to execute. Uh, you'll see it has a customized folder structure, and I can drill into one of these folders, and what you'll see are the individual query pairs. Uh, each query pair uh, will have a name, uh, who last modified it, and it will have the status of the last execution of that particular test. Uh, if I go ahead and drill into one of these query pairs, uh, what you'll see is the query pair is comprised of two sides. We have a source side on the left and a target side on the right. Uh, both source and target will have a connection drop down. This specifies what you're defining as your source data store and what you're defining as your target data store. Uh, customers will typically have maybe five or 10 different types of connections that they're working with on a day to day basis. This is a demo environment, so we have quite a few different connections. And you can see whether you're connecting to cloud architectures like Azure Data Lake or AWS Redshift. Uh, whether you're dealing with flat files like CSVs or Excel documents, whether you're connecting to streaming services like Kafka or big data environments like Hive or HD Insights, Query Search has the capability of connecting to all these different types of technologies. Uh, these uh, connections are configured in the administration area of Query Search and then can be used in any test that you create. You'll see in this example, I'm connecting to an Oracle sales database as well as an Oracle data warehouse. But you can test across disparaging technology. So I could have Oracle as my source and SQL Server as my target, or a flat file as my source and a Snowflake data warehouse as my target system. Uh, Query Surge is making two separate connections, so the databases that you're testing do not have to be linked in any way. Once you've defined your connections, the next step is to uh, put in the query that's going to be used to retrieve the data that you want to test. Uh, this query can be typed in manually uh, if you've already using queries for your testing. Um, it will support any native syntax to the technology that you're working with. So because these are Oracle databases, I can use Oracle functions or stored procedures. Uh, I can use multiple, uh, multiple statements in my request, just like you would in an Oracle script. Uh, and if my a target side was a different technology. The syntax there would be unique again to the technology that we are working with. We also have a query wizard, which I'm going to demonstrate in a minute, which can build these queries for you through a graphical inter interface that's part of Query Search. Once you've defined these queries and have them in place, the next step would be to execute them. Uh, and when you execute the query pair, when the result comes back, it's going to look something like this. It's going to tell you the overall status of your test, in this case, this particular test failed. You'll see that it retrieved almost 6,500 records from our source system and the exact same number of records from our target system. So because those rows match up, we have a zero row count difference, which is good. Uh, however, we do have 
seven records that have a data mismatch. So out of those 6,500 records that we tested, seven of them have uh, data that don't match between our source and our target system. Uh, below that, you'll see some basic performance metrics. Query Surge will tell you how long it took to request the data from your source system, as well as how long it took to request the data from your target system, and then how long it took Query Surge to do the analysis. And you can see for the total runtime of testing these 6,500 records, Query Surge completed in a little over three seconds. Now, when you're looking, now when you're ready to do a deeper analysis and say, well, why exactly did these this test fail? Uh, we would like to click on the View Query Results button. And when I click on that, you'll see it'll open up a modal window and it will showcase all of the data that came from my source query. And you'll see it, I can scroll through all 6,500 records here if I need to, uh, as well as my target system. So it has all the data that came from my target query. But what we're really interested in are the failures. So if I click on the failures tab, which you'll see if you recall from the previous screen, we had seven records that had a data mismatch between our source and target. Well, these are the seven records on the source side that don't, um, that don't match up with the seven records on the target side. Uh, and you can see most of this looks okay, but if we scroll over, eventually you're gonna find some uh, values that don't match between source or target. And this is the reason that this particular test failed. So of course, if you find these types of errors, this is something that you'd wanna pass on to your development team. Query Search has the ability to export this data out as either Excel, CSV, or XML documents. We also have an export all button and what that will do is that will take each one of these tabs and put them into a separate sheet into an Excel workbook. Query Search has the capability of finding two types of errors. The first is a data failure, which is what's displayed here, where we have a mismatch between our source and target systems. The other type of failure that Query Search can capture is what's called a non-matching row. And that would be a scenario where we have a record on either the source or target side that doesn't have a corresponding record to compare to on the other side. So just to showcase that for a minute, I'm going to open up a separate test and you'll see the results of this test. Uh, we have 4,972 records on my source side and 4,976 records on my target side. So that's a row count of four that is different and all four records that, are, uh, that don't have a match all reside on the target system. So again, if we wanted to see more details on that, we can click our view query results button. I can go to that failures tab and what you'll see in this case is it's going to display me the four records on the target side that don't have a record to compare to on the source side. These could be duplicated, or maybe they were records that shouldn't have come over in the ETL process. But whatever the reason, we have this information and can pass that on to the dev team for analysis. So as I mentioned, when you're building query pairs, you can either type in the queries directly, but the other option we have is we have a query wizard. And the query wizard is a graphical interface that will allow you to build and execute these tests. So the first step in the wizard is you're going to define what your source and target systems are. So just like uh, we saw in the query pair, you'll see the same uh, drop down menu and I'm gonna choose our same environments because this is where we have our sample data set up. So I have my Oracle sales database as my source uh, and I'm gonna choose my uh, data warehouse as my target. Uh, there are three types of tests that you could run through the query wizard. Um, we have a row count comparison that will just compare the number of records between source or target. It does not test the data. Uh, this is good for a smoke or sanity test that you may want to run. It'll execute really quickly and you can do that before you do any in more in-depth testing. We have a table level comparison option. Uh, this is great for data migration or data modernization projects where you're essentially expecting the data sets to be exactly the same between your source and target systems. And then the first option here, column level comparison. We use this option when we know the schemas are gonna be slightly different between our source and target systems. Uh, they may have different column names, different amounts of columns in the tables we're testing. So this gives us a little bit more granular uh, detail when we're defining our test. So that's the one I'm gonna to choose to demonstrate here. So next thing you'll do is select your databases uh, that you're working with. So I'll go ahead and make those selections. And then what you'll see is a list of all the tables in my source in target systems. So what I'm gonna do here, just to make it a little easier to see, we have some filtering options. And due to my requirements, I know that there's an orders table 
in my source system that aligns with a purchase table in my target system. So if I wanted to find a test between the two, simply drag a line uh, between the two tables. And that does one of three things. It creates the new query pair. This query pair is going to then later be placed in the folder structure that we saw before that contains all of my tests. It's going to show me all of the columns that exist in both source and target tables. And you'll see it starts to construct the queries for me in the bottom left hand and bottom right hand side of the screen. So again, I would take my requirements and use them to understand how the data gets aligned. And you'll see, I'm just going to make a few uh, different uh, comparisons here. And each time I draw a line between uh, two different columns, you'll see that my queries are getting modified down below. I can also apply filtering criteria if necessary. So for instance, if I only wanted to display records from my source where the order was placed this month, um, I can go ahead and put that filter criteria into my test and it will add the necessary filtering into your query pair. Once you've gotten the query pair to a state where you think you should be returning data sets that should match up, if you need to create additional tests, it's as easy as dragging another line between two new tables. It will go ahead and do that and associating the columns. Once you've built all the different tests that you need to do with the wizard, uh, you can move to the last phase, which is to add them to an existing or new folder in the design library. And we can also set them up into a suite which we're going to use for scheduling and execution. And I'm going to transition into that section of query search now. So once you've built these tests, the next phase is to schedule them to execute. Uh, so I'm going to open up uh, a specific query pair. What you'll see is this query pair has nine uh, different, um, or this suite has nine different query pairs that are set for execution. Uh, you can add additional queries if you want to run in this suite simply by dragging over an individual query pair or you can drag over an entire folder in which case it'll add all of these query pairs in that folder to be set up for execution. If you need to exclude a few you can go ahead and remove them and you can also save any of those changes. I'm not going to save those changes because um, it's not something I want to keep. So what I'd like to illustrate is I'm going to look to execute a suite called shipping. You'll see this suite has five individual query pairs that are set up for execution. You can run these one of three ways. You can either run it on demand, in which case it will execute right away. Uh, you can schedule a scenario. So let's say I want to run these over the weekend. I can go ahead and select my date and time. And then you can go ahead and add the suites that you want to run. So not only can I run my shipping suite, which has my five tests in it, I can run other suites as well. So maybe I select my demo and my smoke test. Uh, you'll see here query surge has it set to run these on any agent. So you can run as many of these suites as necessary for as many agents as you have running. So if I had three agents running, all of these suites can run in parallel. But the way a lot of our customers want to run their test is through some type of event based execution. So what I'm going to showcase here is I have a Jenkins project. Uh, I'm going to kick off a build. And what this has in this project is a pipeline setup that is going to trigger uh, an ETL job. And once that ETL job completes, uh, it is going to then trigger the tests and query search that need to be run in order to verify that this ETL job ran correctly. So what you'll see is we are at 100% of our ETL job. The next phase of this is to make the request to query search through our API. Uh, and then it's going to pull query search to give us the current status uh, of the run. So if I toggle. Eric, can I interrupt just a quick second? Sure, Bill. Um, it's it's 12.59. That means it's 29 minutes. We're not going to end at that uh, 1 o'clock. We're going to run over a little bit. So please hang on. Keep going, Eric. Sorry. So you'll see the query uh, that sweet, uh, shipping suite is executing. You'll see it ran pretty fast. We've gotten all the results back. I can drill in here and uh, showcase any of the results that we got. You'll see the summary metrics on the right, and you'll see the same tabs we saw earlier uh, down at the bottom. So if I wanted to investigate any failures for these particular runs, uh, I can do so. And just like before, it will be highlighted when there are differences. Uh, if I go back into our Jenkins job, uh, you'll see that the result of the scenario does get passed back to the build pipeline. 
Uh, so that will tell us when there are issues and you can put in any type of conditional logic that uh, may be necessary. And you'll get an automatic email notification uh, indicating whether the test was successful. Uh, it'll tell you what your pass rate is from a query pair perspective, but it also tells you how accurate your data is. And you'll see all of the summary metrics below. And I'm not gonna do it here, but if you click on any one of these links, these have drill down capabilities and it will take you directly to the query pair results in the scenario.